Good evening, everybody. Joining us in YouTube land. Uh, Hector is going to be capturing it from his house and sending it to Facebook. So also, welcome anyone who's watching on Facebook. I'm going to give just a few minutes in case anyone's going to join on Zoom that hasn't done so yet. Uh, please feel free as we're going. Ask questions. I can see the YouTube side. Um, Hector will just chime in and let us know if there's anything on the Facebook side. I could do that maybe, but juggling too many things, I'll mess it, I'll mess it up. I heard Cecilia! Is that me? Yay! Yay! Victory! It Our... just takes me a long time, doesn't it? <laughs> Our war with the microphone settings was finally won, yes. Uh, First, we, I want to say that. We miss you. I was uh, delighted to see that you were popping up on our Zoom, because I missed seeing uh, you. I'm so glad, too. I missed the other ones for some reason. I'd see it afterwards. Well, here you are. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're not here in Phillipsburg, uh, we are getting quite the snowfall, as promised. <laughs> by our uh, weather folks. I decided to shovel on my way over here just to clear a path for myself. That that was a thick layer of very mm -hmm. soft, beautiful snow, for sure. It is. Good thing it's cold out. It's not a wet snow. That's yes. <laughs> Agreed. All right, so we're going to be in Revelation 21. I'm going to have a lot of the scriptures we uh, refer to tonight on the screen. Just to be helpful, but um, if you have your hard copy Bible there, you might have a different translation than I use, and that's good for, tr for comparison. All right. Well, if anyone jumps in on Zoom, uh, we'll say hello to them as they come in. But let's start by asking our Father for his help. We always need his help. Whenever we look to his word, it's a spiritually discerned thing. And uh, revelation, I don't know if I'll say especially, but... Yeah, uniquely, maybe, uh, in the New Testament at least. There are some Old Testament passages like this. We need his help to discern his symbols and what he's trying to convey to us in this revelation of truth. So, uh, would anyone in the Zoom like to lead us in prayer? Yeah, I'll, go. I'll do it. All right, thank you, Dewey. Our Father in the heavens, we come to you, our glorious God, Name above names, king above kings, lord above lords. You are everything to us. Without you, we have nothing, Lord. So we come to you for all things, to honor you, to praise you, to ask you for your help. Mm -hmm. So we ask this evening that your spirit fill us, and fill Ryan especially as he shares the word with, you, with us, that we may hear listen and learn may it fall deep within our hearts and minds that we would not forget and we would learn how to apply any of this that's necessary to our lives to do so Lord I thank you that my brothers and sister are here this evening and anyone on YouTube that's watching uh, I pray your hand over them all especially anyone that may have to travel this evening Lord we give you thanks in all things through Christ. Amen. 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 All right, once again, if you are watching either on YouTube or Facebook, if you would please uh, ask any questions, make any comments uh, that come to your mind that you think uh, would help at all the conversation. Most of the time it will. Maybe I shouldn't word it if you think so, because a lot of times we assume it won't when it actually would. Uh, so if it comes to mind, share it with us. And uh, I'd like to, for this to be as interactive as possible. I think that's the best way for uh, disciples to come to the Word together interactively. The Spirit speaks through all of us to each of us as we're open to Him. All right, so we're going to be carrying on in Revelation 21. And I just want to do a review. I would say quick, but I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, if you remember, in, in the bulk of the Revelation... What I understand to be in a cyclical way, in a 
the more technical term, the recapitulating way. Uh, John has received his vision from the angel sent by Jesus, a vision that God the Father gave to Jesus. John is meant to pass it on to the seven churches, and obviously not just to them, because here it is in our hands, almost what, about 1,900 years later plus. Um, but what we've seen for the bulk of this revelation is a vision of God's reign and dominion over all the powers of the heavens and earth, but also a picture of that war that is going on. And so there is, of course, the depiction of the powers of heavens and earth rebelling against God, uh, against his people, or warring against his people. And this, this whole thing has really been a call to the followers of Jesus to remain faithful. He's made wonderful promises. He's also given us dire warnings. Uh, all of this has been a call to faithfulness, even in the face of suffering and death. Uh, but just like all the Old Covenant prophets that are being re referenced all the way through this thing, a large part of this is to say that in all of the difficulty, in all of the, the testing, and in all of the temptation to become disloyal to the true God and to Master Jesus, if you will do that, here's a vision of what awaits you. I mean, this is what the, the prophets of the Old Covenant scriptures were given. This is what John is given, a picture of what awaits. And so we're getting here uh, in, chapters in chapter 21 a picture of the new heaven and new earth. But most specifically, we're getting a vision in this part we're looking at now of the new Jerusalem. It's coming down out of heaven. Uh as we, you know, we've seen it over and over again, but in, in Isaiah 65, when Isaiah mentioned the new heavens and new earth, he very quickly jumped to what Jerusalem would look like in that setting, and that's what John receives as well. New heavens and new earth, yay, big, broad, and beautiful, but now let's talk about Jerusalem specifically. This is a Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. This is not the earthly Jerusalem being made better. This is a, a whole new Jerusalem that God is bringing down to earth. So, it's fantastic. Uh, what we're going to do is read verses uh, 9 to the end of the chapter. And I'm going to bring it up here. I'm going to hide myself. Nope, that's not what I want. Yeah, I'll hide myself, but then I have to put this up. There we are. All right. So, uh, let me read this for us here. So, this is Revelation 21, starting in verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits. I just want to remind you, in the NIV it says 144 cubits thick. As we saw last week, it actually doesn't say the word thick in the original language. All it says is it measured 144 cubits. So the question becomes... Is the wall that thick, or is it that tall? Because we know how long it is. Uh, there's, there's the rub. Which, which dimension was he describing for us? Um, so we talked about that last time. Picking it up at verse 18. The wall was made of jasper, and the city, the whole city, of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third 
I I looked this up because I, I pronounced this wrong most of my life, apparently. Agate is how you pronounce this third one. The fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the fifth sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. I, you know, you're, you're thinking to yourself as you read, the, the whole thing is outrageous. I mean, this whole description is completely outrageous, right? Size, materials, my gosh. Quality, pure as glad. Oh my goodness. Anyway, the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. So the, the gold you put in the street is that pure, for goodness sake. Verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Whoo, my! So this, this vision has an effect on you. I mean, you don't have to even study it with any depth, just to, if you're taking it in, just to go... What? <laughs> wow. And I think that's a big part of the way this is um, revealed and the way it's written by John. So he's receiving it, I'm sure, overwhelmed. And then he's passing it on to us, hopefully in a way that begins to overwhelm us as well. Okay. Now, let's. I just want to reiterate a few things as we move into this. Number one, why in the world should we care about this level of um, detail in the description of this city. Like, what the heck? <laughs> Don't we want to know about other things? Like, so many conversations I've had with people in, in this Bible study group uh, included. We want to know other details about this place. I want to know, uh, is there amusement? Uh, do we eat? And if so, what? Um, are we working? You know, there's all these day-to-day uh, -day life relational uh, is there commerce? All those kinds of questions. And instead, in the vision, God to Jesus, to the angel, to John, to the churches, the choice is, let's describe dimensions, materials, and the quality of materials. And I'm just thinking to myself, somebody might be asking themselves as they read or listen, why in the world is this the priority for the description <laughs> of all the things we could talk about? Uh, well, number one, we do have to keep in mind the question of literalism versus sim symbolism. It may be incorrect, I'm not saying it is, but it may be incorrect to assume that the goal here is to give us tons and tons of information about the actual city and what life will be like in that city. It's very possible the, the use of these uh, pictures is the effect it's meant to have, as well as some of the connections to the Old Covenant that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, it ought to overwhelm us, like we saw last week. This, this, just the size, the scope of this thing is absurd to us. Uh, 1,400 miles in any direction for a city, let alone in all directions for a city. Oh, my good grief. Um... So anyway, that, that's just a thought I have. Uh, any other thoughts? Why do you suppose God gives this much attention to these kinds of details regarding this New Jerusalem vision? Any, anybody else have thoughts about why he might do that? Just the, like, the whole entire awesomeness of it looks like to just, in, you know, like, impossible to imagine how like giant and large it is even though we know the numbers like to, to visualize that is still just 
way out of at least my capability of you know visualizing how just ginormous it is. Yeah. Uh, again, just just as a reminder that for a city. <laughs> yes, for one city, this is about half of the United States continental United States of America. Across. I was thinking. I was thinking also um, when he talked about all those precious gems and and the gold and what how much we value that here. We're using it, for the, and look, Kevin, we're going to be walking on it. Um, yeah. I mean, how how amazing yes. that is. Yeah, and we're going to be we're going to be thinking through that the the implications of um, the materials used for building the city, not for not for ornamentation, not for jewelry, you know, not the small scale stuff because it's so rare. We're talking about for the largest scale usage. This is what we're using. <laughs> like, yeah, like the foundations are like encrusted in jewels. Like yeah, the foundation. Who the heck is even seeing foundations, for goodness sake, that you're going to encrust them with jewels, right? Uh, now, in, in mortal human earthly life, for unless you're extravagantly wealthy, you when you have a large quantity of something required, you try to find whatever is most affordable. And then whatever you're going to put over it, you might invest some, you know. But you're going to lay foundations in concrete, you're going to lay rock, you know, whatever... So, so right, that yeah. is true. Spaces, it looks good, but not yet. Yeah, the extravagance of this wealth must be a part of it. Because remember, this whole revelation has been about kingdoms and kings in competition with one another, God being the primary and the, the lamb at his right hand uh, included in that. But also his people called to be kings and, and royalty with him. Uh, I don't mean that gender specific. I just mean ruling royalty, and so so all of that against the powers of Satan and his his dominion and his his leaders under him. So again, when we get to the end of this thing, what we're seeing is the triumphant king, the one on the throne and the lamb, are are demonstrating to all of their kingdom, this new creation, the the extravagance, the greatness of this king. <laughs> oh, it's it is. It's overwhelming. So I agree. I, I think whether you're trying to get an idea of what your new eternal capital city is going to look like, I don't know if this is literally what it's going to look like, but I'm not exactly sure that that's even the whole point. I think we're meant to be overwhelmed by the greatness of the king that would have such a city as his capital city. Um, so, no, go ahead, Hector. I was just, I was just, uh, every time I read this, I, I, I always find it amusing in, like, verse 22, and it, it appears like John's looking for a temple, like, he's, so, yes. like, to me, it, it's, I think, I would tend to think it's more literal, because he's, like, literally, I saw no temple in the city, and then he's, like, well, the temple is, is the, the Lord of God, the Almighty and the Lamb, you know, but he's, like, looking for one, he really was. Yeah, <laughs> and as a good Jew, you would, you would expect that from him, right. that is the center of... Oh, yeah the center of the world. So, Yeah, I, I think what, uh, just to clarify, I, I am convinced what John saw, he literally saw. I'm speaking more as to the purpose of giving him that vision. So I don't think John is, is making this up. I, he's, he did see everything he said he saw. My, my question is, but what does that mean for, for reality? Cecilia, what were you going to say? Well, I was just amazed that the gates aren't that were made of pearls, but did each one's one pearl. <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah. To me. yeah. Only pearls, not gate. Well, I don't even know the biggest pearl I've seen, but I know it's nowhere near that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're talking about being overwhelmed by the description. Uh, we're going to be talking about how pearls uh, were used, viewed, and all that in the Roman Empire. But I think anyone listening to this being read to them in the first century of these seven churches, I mean, if their if their mouths if their jaws weren't slack already by the time they get to the the gate thing, that's that's like over the top. That is ridiculous, because yeah, what what kind of clam, <laughs> what kind of <laughs> shelled creature yeah. could Wonder produce? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Are you kidding me? Uh, now, see, we're, we're about like a minute and a half behind on Facebook. 
Facebook, but uh, Betty had mentioned, Betty Teves, uh, that uh, the tip, southern tip of Texas to Canadian border is 1,602 miles alone. Is what? I'm sorry, no, what? I'm sorry, I yeah, didn't hear that. From the southern tip of Texas to the Canadian border is 1,602 miles. Oh, wow. So it's almost, it's almost the entirety uh, north to south. Yeah. Right? Like, mind-blowingly gargantuan in this city. In its dimensions as given. Yeah. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, I, when I was doing my study last week, I, I took the time to do east-west, and you filled in that gap for me. Thank you. North-south. No, I'm, I'm good here. Thanks. Dude, he's <laughs> <laughs> having a little conversation with his buddy there. Okay. So let's jump in to the details. As, as Even if it is true that this is symbolic and not literal, that does not dissuade me from wanting to look at the language used carefully. Because again, symbolic does not mean meaningless. It's the exact opposite. Symbolism is a meaning full. It is full of meaning. That's the whole point of symbolism. And so, even if God is giving John a vision representing reality, he gave these symbols on purpose. He chose them carefully. And that's why I want to look at them carefully. Uh, that's one mistake I've, I've heard um, some make when they're arguing for the literal reading you would think that if it were symbolic, then we don't have to care too much and it doesn't really matter what it means. And as I'm listening to them say that, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Complete opposite. If it's okay. literal, I'm thinking, oh, okay, good to know. If it's symbolic, I'm like, oh, well, why? Why did you pick that number? Why did you pick that material? So just wanted to clarify that. I, if, in case anyone thinks that when I speak of it being symbolic that I'm like, eh, whatevs. No, quite quite the opposite. What were you going to say, well, Hector? The other, the other thing I noticed, oh. too, is it uh, speaks of the gold as being pure. You know, pure, you think of being flawless. You know, so it gives me the impression that, of course, the whole city's flawless. It's perfect. It's yes. Pure. And, and by the way, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but when you talk about gold being as clear as glass... Is that even something earthlings have ever experienced? No. <laughs> like, pure gold is opaque. <laughs> it just doesn't have any impurities in it. You, you've culled out all the impurities. It, it doesn't become transparent just because you made it real pure. So there's something going on there in that description, too. And by the way, we've seen that uh, in descriptions clear as crystal when we talked about the sea in the heavenly throne room scene. Clear as crystal. Clarity, purity, transparency being equated to purity, I think is a really interesting connection made multiple times in the Revelation because taking the whole revelation of the scriptures of God to his people, if hypocrisy is pretense, which it is, it's the wearing of a mask, it's pretending to be what you're not, that is opaque. Uh, on purpose, you're putting something in front to to block what's real. The way we use the language of transparency, you know, metaphorically, is if so, if there's transparency in government, and hold back your laughter. But if there's transparency in government, the idea is there's nothing blocking your sight. You can see it as it actually is. What's really going on? So uh, again, whether this is God's intent or not, I I assume so, but I could be wrong. For there to be this much clarity, transparency in his city of, of the center of everything, to me that speaks of the openness and honesty and reality and truth that dominate in his kingdom. This hiding, this pretending, all of that stuff, it, there's no place for that. Which goes exactly in line with Jesus' teachings. He hated, hated, hated hypocrisy. Uh, according to him, that is the plank in the eye. That is the poison in the well, all, my, all our different metaphors. That is the heart of the danger people are in, is when they're being hypocritical. So, that's just a thought I had about that transparency part. All right. Now, before we move on to some of these details, uh, just to follow up on something I brought up last week in regard to a, a few of the details of um, 
the 12 and the 12. We saw that uh, each of the 12 gates had the name or the names of the apostles, the 12 apostles. No, sorry, I'm backwards. Uh, the 12 sons of Jacob, the tribes of Israel, and then the foundations were uh, according to the apostle, apostolic band of Jesus. And I was talking about last time how, as important as all these people are, these 12 and these 12, we often don't have a great familiar, familiarity with them in the churches. And I shared in my, my, in my past that was true. You know, Somebody had to challenge me on that uh, because of their importance. So what I thought we could do, just quickly, I don't want to take too much time on this, is um, just take a look, work through together. What are the names of these people? I'm going to change this over to Microsoft. Not the Microsoft Store. I want Microsoft were, Word. There it is. You were mentioning number 12, and it, it, it called to mind, like, Jesus' ministry starts when he's 12 years old and he's going to the temple. Like, the first time I hear about Jesus, kid Jesus going teaching teachers is also 12. That's true. Yep. Like, it seems like it's kind of like the beginning of like something being set in motion, like a, a more fuller fulfillment of some things, like the beginning of it. I like that very like, much, you yes. Know, you get the 12 disciples, Jesus 12, like it seems like it's, it's kind of like seed. the start of something big, you know. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Uh, so with that in mind, let's, let's work through, now don't look yet. If you need to look later, it's in Exodus chapter 1 as a real quick, easy reference for this. Anybody uh, just throw out some names of the, the tribes of Israel or the sons of Jacob? I'll try to keep up with you. Benjamin. Okay. The youngest. Dan. Good. Judah. Judah, the tribe of our master. Levi. Levi, the tribe of the priesthood. Uh, the two half tribes, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, spelling, spelling. Okay, now they <laughs> they together make up what tribe of the twelve? Uh, again. These two together are two halves of which whole tribe? Which son of Jacob? Joseph. Thank you. So Joseph was not considered one of Jacob's sons at the end of Genesis. He said, your two sons born here in Egypt, I will make them my sons now. And so, yeah, they became, together they became Joseph's tribe. Okay. I don't like this misspelling. Let's see if it knows what I'm trying to say. <laughs> there. Ah, uh, it is an E. Shame on me. Okay. What else we got? Hey, Bill's with us. Welcome aboard, brother. All right, glad you did. We're just doing a quick review of the twelve tribes and the twelve apostles, just for our familiarity. I'll just let you know how far behind you I am. The last time I was here was verse five. Oh, that was only a few months ago, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think so. We got some catching up to do. So we have five, five of the uh, tribes of Israel so far. Then. Well, in the chapter in chapter twenty one, we're uh, we haven't really started talking about it yet, but we're going to be talking uh, starting in verse seventeen. No, no, I'm sorry, nineteen, nineteen. All right, so we have Benjamin, Dan, Judah, Levi, Ephraim, Manasseh, which make up Joseph. That's five. We need the rest of our tribes. We have the, the baby Benjamin. Okay, do we mention that? That's first on our list here. Do we have? Uh... Reuben, yeah, he's the oldest. Simeon. Ah, Ryan Parrish. Simeon, okay. Simeon and Simon, it's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> For we uh, Americanized English speakers here. <laughs> Two, four, six, seven. We need five more. Uh, Z, uh, Zebulun. Good. Zebulun, whatever it is. Now, Zebulun goes with an N, N name because of in the New Testament, they're located close up north. Anybody? Zebulun and... and... Naphtali? Good, yeah. Those are put together in uh, something Matthew wrote, one of the prophecies Matthew quoted. Zebulun and Naphtali. 
They were up, way up north uh, above Galilee. All right, two, four, six, eight, nine. We need three more tribes. Uh, they have to say Dan, the short ones. We Dan, do have Dan. I did. You said, what was the other short one you said? Uh, Dan and Gad. Gad, yeah. I was reviewing this with my kids, and I was like, it's a type of fly. They're like horse, <laughs> shoe. <laughs> no, that, that wasn't a helpful the clue. The horse. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's a car. So, almost like a namesake for uh, Grandpa Isaac. Yeah. Is that all of them or this one? We have one more. I have Benjamin, Dan, Judah, Levi, Ephraim, Manasseh, which is Joseph, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, Naphtali, Gad, and Issachar. Who are uh, we missing? Asher, because uh, Asher pulls. Good, good, good. All right. So that's the 12. If you had any trouble thinking of them, you're not alone. But that's a part of the reason for this exercise, just to become more and more familiar with these uh, super important people in the story. Now, more important even than they, in terms of the gospel of Jesus making it to us where we are, um, are the 12 apostles. So let's, as quick as we can, let's try to think of the 12 apostles. Hopefully this will be easier for us. Are we counting the traitor or are we counting the replacement? We'll do, we'll do both. So if... Throw them out there. Bartholomew. Good. Let's start. Let's start with old Bart. He's not. He's not as well. He's not as well attested to in our list. See? Sorry. Jesus knows him. It's That's right. <laughs> he was faithful. Of course, the easy ones. Peter. Peter, also known as Simon. Okay. James. John. Sons of Thunder. Right. Who is Peter's brother? Andrew. Good. Yeah, the fisherman. That's the five. Thaddeus. Good. We now, Matthew already? The most Matthew, obvious. good. Also known as Levi. Yeah. Now, Thaddeus is also a, a second name or an alternate name. And I'm trying to think now. I think it was of James, James the Lesser, it's, he's called. I believe that's right. Yeah, yeah, James the Great, James the Lesser. I think you're right. Okay, what else do we have here? That's two, four, six, seven. Who is the doubter, so-called? Thomas. Thomas, poor Thomas, gets a bad rap on that one, I think. I know, that's all he gets. <laughs> now, Judas was mentioned as the traitor. We're going to... Yes. We're going to pair him... Oops. What did I hear? It's not Judas. It, there is a zealot, though, named Simon. So there's a pair of Simons. There's a pair of Jameses. I have two Jameses here. What, what am I doing? John. We get Philip. Philip. Very good. Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. By the way, who replaced Judas? Matthias. Good. Almost a duplicate of Matthew, I'll, I'll but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> so who's the poor guy that we have left out so far? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. Bartholomew. We're missing one person. Bartholomew, Simon Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thaddeus, or James, Matthew, Levi, Thomas, Judas, or Ma replaced by Matthias, Simon, and Philip. Simon the Zealot. Who are we missing here? Is there, isn't there another Judas? Good. There is a repeat of... And actually, what that makes me think of is I may be incorrect about who Thaddeus... I think Thaddeus is the Judas. And so I'm going to put the other James as a separate one. James the Lesser, he's called. Poor James the Lesser. <laughs> Uh, hopefully that just means he's younger, not that he's less important. <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's good. If he's less on earth, then he might, you know, he'd be good up in heaven. Hey, That's amen. <laughs> the greatest among you is the one who serves. So right. <laughs> that was a quick review, um, I, but I do want us to be able to be well-trained in this because these two groups of 12 are foundational gateways in this vision. 
And uh, I think that tells us something. So thank you for bearing with that. I'm going to go back now to our... We did great together, but I, I can't promise alone I would have done as well. <laughs> right, yep. And that that's a part of why it's good we're doing this together. Okay. So let's jump into some of these details now um, of the vision John received. So going back to Revelation 21, just let's, I guess, jump in at verse 18. The wall was made of jasper, as I mentioned last week. So you're picturing, likely, this is the green form of jasper in, in the more ancient way of viewing it. So you're maybe in your mind, in your imagination, you're picturing a green, greenish glowing city coming down, which I think is really an interesting choice for the color scheme. Now, often in, in our minds, green is associated with life. I'm not sure if that's necessarily what God had in mind when he gave this uh, vision, but it makes sense to me. Uh, we have to be careful of our modern associations aren't always the associations originally in the scriptures. Okay, uh, the wall is jasper, but the city is pure gold. So what John is seeing, the gigantic city that is, and here's the, we do know that the city is um, 12,000 stadia high. Does that mean the walls are that high or the buildings are that high? That's what we were talking about last week. Who knows? We, we can't be certain of that. But it's just like this gigantic green gold thing coming down out of heaven to earth. Uh, overwhelming, no doubt, from the very beginning of this whole thing. And then he talks about the foundations of the city walls. And it says they're decorated, so they're not, they're not pure, the whole thing is made of this precious stone. It has these precious stones somehow embedded in it or, or decorating it. Um, but what's interesting, as we're going to be looking at, is the collection of precious stones here is not new. Surprise, surprise, is not new to this vision. So uh, what I'm going to do is ask you to turn to, let me find it in my notes. In uh, the book of Exodus, and actually I didn't even write down the reference, that was silly. Let me, uh, let me look up here. In the breastplate design that God gave to, oh, hmm. well that didn't help. Alright, so I'm going to go to uh, Beryl. You say that it makes me, like, I'm always trying to think of like what the shadow represents and like the the future and I just kind of picture it's kind of cool. They were wearing like the the like uniform that represented like the New Jerusalem. Like they're actually wearing like the the uniform, you know, of like because all these parts are part of New Jerusalem in some way. Yes. Yeah. yeah so I'm in Exodus 28, and we're starting. Uh, let's start in verse 15. This is the description God gave to Moses of uh, how to make the breast piece, that's why when I put breastplate it didn't come up, breast piece for the um, high priest to wear. And before we read this, I just wanted to let you know or remind you, on, on the shoulders of the high priest were to be two stones. And they were to have inscribed in each of the two stones six of the tribes. So the priest is to have the twelve names of the sons of Jacob on his shoulders, and he's to bear the weight of their sacrifices and all that, God says. And then on his chest, he's wearing stones, one for each of the tribes. So there's two very clear ways in which the high priest is bearing the, uh, the twelve tribes on his person when he's in his garb. I just think that's really significant. Why would God want it that way? I don't fully understand. But when we get to the, the breast piece, there are 12 precious stones. And I want to talk about the relationship or the similarities in the two lists. So I'm going to read here in uh, Exodus 28, starting verse 15. Fashion a breast piece for making decisions. Uh, this will later be called Urim and Thummim. Uh, the work of skilled hands. Make it like the e ephod of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. 
It is to be a square. Now, isn't that interesting? The city is square in its, in its length and width. A span long and a span wide and folded double. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. So there's three. The second row, turquoise, lapis lazuli, and emerald. That's six. The third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And then the fourth row is topaz, onyx, and jasper. So I compiled the list of the breastplate stones, breastpiece stones, and then I compiled the list from the New Jerusalem Foundations. And what I found was, in the NIV, and that's, that's an important detail here, in the NIV, the uh, breastpiece stones, there's two of them that don't match in the New Jerusalem stones. There's carnelian and lapis lazuli in the NIV. On the New Jerusalem stones, the two that don't match are sapphire and ruby. I thought, well, now why would God go through all this trouble to clearly make these parallels between the stones of the breastpiece and the foundations if two of them are different? I thought, this is weird. What do I do with that? Well, come to find out, if you were to look at other translations, guess what happens? The language lines up so that they're the exact same list. So translation matters in this case, if you're studying, which again, we've talked about this many times. Using different translations is a very helpful tool in your study. Uh, so anyway, sapphire and lapis lazuli are translated to be the same thing in some translations, and then ruby and carnelian are translated to be the same thing in some translations. I was looking at the original Greek, and that, that checks out, that the lists actually are, I think, meant to be exact in their parallels. The order is different, but the precious jewels, or the precious uh, gems, I'm sorry, stones, are the same that are listed here. In fact, when I got to the sixth one, uh, the sixth foundation stone in the New Jerusalem, in the NIV it says the ruby, but if you look at the translations, it could also be trans translated sardius, carnelian, red quartz. So clearly, there's some vagueness about what this gem is, and the translators have to make this tough decision. How do we communicate what, what this is probably saying? Now, here's what's, here's what's fascinating to me. Okay, so you could just say, oh, okay, so God's recycling uh, stones. Cool. But what's interesting is the way that he shifted their significance. In the breast piece, they represent the 12 tribes. He didn't do that in the New Jerusalem. He puts the names of the 12 tribes on the gates. He shifts the, the um, precious stones to correspond to the apostles now. What do we do with that? Why would he shift it from what they originally represented, which were the 12 tribes, to now representing the 12 apostles? I don't want to put any meaning that's not there, but that's a question I think we, we should work through, because that's clearly what happened. God shifted it. So, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is something I've already mentioned, which is, in the great work of God, the great mystery of God, that he kept hidden for ages and generations in the past, embedded in all these Old Testament scriptures and, and images and storyline, that... Uh, mystery was not revealed and, and made known to the world until Jesus and the Apostles, including uh, the Apostle Paul, which is not in our list of twelve. And so perhaps, uh, it even goes back to what Hector mentioned, perhaps what was uh, in, in its infancy stage in the twelve tribes came more to its fullness in the twelve Apostles, which is going to come to its ultimate fullness in this new Jerusalem. So I just wonder if the connection of the precious gems to the apostles, if that change is significant in terms of um, showing that progression of what God's been up to. Uh, that's one thought that came to mind. Any other thoughts about that? Do you, do you think there's a significance to the fact that the stones went from being associated with the 12 tribes to being associated with the apostles?
If not, that's okay. All right. So let's carry on here. So the 12, uh, 12 uh, tribes are represented at the gates. 12 apostles are represented in the foundations. And now we see in verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each gate made of a single pearl. <laughs> Every time I read it, I'm like, huh? How can this be? The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. So uh, I was looking into pearls, just in, in terms of what, what would the er earliest readers and hearers of this revelation been associating with pearls that I'm not, because I'm living in the 20th, 21st century in America. Uh, and actually, there's, there's a lot you can find. I'm just going to show you here. Let me hide my face. I'm going to show you one article I found. No, nope. that is a map. That is not what I want. Where'd it go? When you do pearls in Rome, you can find out where to buy pearls in the city of Rome. <laughs> That's not what I'm going for. Oh, okay. Uh, Here's one. Any, thanks, though. <laughs> yeah. I'm good, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Jewelpedia. Clearly, their focus is on jewels and precious things like that. Uh, they had some really good information here. I'm not going to have you read through it all with me. I just wanted to show you there are some, uh, I think, helpful things you can find online if you're doing your own study of these things. Here's another one. Their whole thing seems to be pearls. And so they did a little history lesson here on the Greek Roman. Uh, view of pearls. So I'll just give you a, a, an idea of some of the things I found online. Of course, I, there's other resources um, in book form that I, I'm looking at. But anyways, I wanted to share with you some of the uh, information I found here, just to give us an idea of, I think, what was God up to when he put the pearl detail into this vision that he gave John. Again, thinking from the Roman uh, Empire the period of, of the first century when this was written. Uh, a lot of the uh, information we have are the writings of people at that time. A lot of them were very critical of the way that Roman citizens and Roman people were being really ostentatious, really prideful, really gaudy about their wealth. Because uh, at the height of the Roman Empire, money was flowing. It was crazy how much wealth was flowing. And it, it wasn't lost on me. As I, as I share some of these things with you, uh, I invite you to think of it with me too. It wasn't lost on me how much of what I'm about to share with you goes along with what we find in the Revelation about the woman. The woman who's bedecked with gold and precious jewels and pearls. We're going to talk about that connection in a little bit. Uh, she's got a golden goblet, she's drunk on the blood of the saints, she is just extravagantly wealthy and flaunting it. And she's obsessed with her own luxuries, her own comforts. Kind of a scary picture of what we think about the state of things in America as well, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Okay, so let's talk about Rome. Pliny the Elder was a, um, a statesman back then, and a writer. He called pearls the very highest having the very highest position among valuables. According to Pliny, this is the or one of the most precious and um, valuable things that there existed at that time, pearls. Uh, now, if you think about why, you know, back then, how, how could you acquire pearls? You had to go find them. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is probably one of the worst kinds of processes to find something. Nowadays, we can uh, farm them. But back then, man, no wonder it's so rare and expensive because of the process you had to go through to find pearls. So uh, at a certain point, the Roman Empire had, had extended far enough through battles and acquisitions like that that they started to uh, find pearls among the peoples they had conquered. And all of a sudden, this became quite the craze. And I was reading about, uh, in Pliny, for instance, he talks about how specifically the women wore them as earrings, on their earrings up to three pearls per earring. They would have them on their fingers, dangling off of strings on their fingers as finger ornamentation. And they would also put pearls in the laces of their sandals. And he actually thought that was disgusting because he's like, oh, so we're at the place where we can walk on pearls now? That's how crazy we've gotten with all this? 
Uh, he talked not favorably about Pompeius Magnus. He's coming in off of a victory, and he's kind of promoting his victory. And uh, he was so ostentatious in his displays of wealth from his victory, he actually had a portrait done of himself using pearls. And to Pliny, this is disgusting. you got to be kidding me with this, right? Um, the, the Romans borrowed the word for pearls that, that we find in our Bible, the Greek word for it. But at least for the big ones... One historian said this was specifically for the bi the biggest and, and the most precious ones. They would use the word unio for, in the Latin, and it means unique and like no other. Um, which either means all the pearls they found to be unique in and among themselves, or it could indicate the unique value that pearls had. Um, so that gives you an idea. The interior of the Temple of Venus was decorated with pearls. The Emperor Caligula, to talk about the... the craziness of, of the way the Romans would use pearls to show their wealth and stuff. <laughs> okay, here's a little nuts on a couple of ways. Number one, he promoted he promoted his horse to be a general in his army. And then, to celebrate his horse's great uh, honor, he gave his horse a necklace of pearls. And of course, if you're a poor Roman paying taxes trying to scrape by, and you see the leader of your great empire putting enough wealth on a horse's neck to take care of your family for a lifetime, this is not going to go over well, right? Now, Nero, uh, he had a... Sep now, by the way, Nero was an em emperor in the time of Paul's execution uh, in the middle of the century there. Nero had a scepter with pearls, a throne with pearls, and he, he was so ostentatious with his wealth he would go to the actors uh, of his of Rome and he would give them masks adorned with pearls all over them. And again, for the average Joe, this is ridiculous, man. They're actors. They're props that you're talking about. And you're putting pearls on them? Um, there was this one story of a Roman... Uh, uh, I think it was the wife of a Roman emperor or someone really important. She was given as a gift this gigantic pearl. It reminded me of the parable of Jesus, the pearl of great price. She tried to sell the pearl, and no one was willing to buy it because of its extravagant value. Like, no, either no one had the money to buy it, or thought it worthwhile to buy. Uh, this, is, this is what pearls would represent. And you can go on and on about this, uh, but I think the point is clear. For the Roman, either citizens or subjects, who hear John's description of gateways on a gigantic city, 12 of them, being made of a single pearl each. This is this is beyond the pale of the imagination. Besides the fact what as we... That? I wonder what it'll weigh. Aren't they pretty dense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For an entire gate to do that. So, is God being ostentatious here? Yes! Absolutely! He is flaunting earthly wealth as if it's no big deal. Because it isn't a big deal to him. <laughs> Thank you. Which is one of the connections I think we need to make. This is this is applicable truth right here, as Dewey prayed about at the beginning of this. This is something we can apply right here and now. Jesus said very plainly to uh, the people of his mortal days, and specifically he was, he was, not surprisingly, criticizing the religious leadership, who were for the most part, according to the Gospels, very concerned with earthly wealth, very interested in that. They had an idol of mammon. And Jesus said, one of, one of the most striking lines I know of that Jesus spoke about wealth is, what is um, valuable to man is detestable to God. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. And uh, it, it could perhaps mean detestable like, you spit it out, I hate it. Uh, and it could very well also have the implication of just something that you walk on. It's just it's of no value to you, you know. You demean it. And uh, literally, in this vision, you walk on gold. So pure, it's transparent. You walk on it. You, you turn buildings, you, you, you turn it into buildings, the common thing in your, in your city. Um, these precious jewels... Uh, to God, eh, just put it in the foundations. 
pearls of unimaginable size and value. Eh, let's make gates out of them. I mean, to me, it's hard to miss... Uh, from the human point of view, God's just showing off how wealthy he is. I think from the God's kingdom point of view, he's showing what you value is of very little value to me, guys. <laughs> this is this is not what I see as the most valuable thing. So that's it's, why... It's almost, as, it's, it's almost as if, it, like you said, he's saying this isn't what's valuable here in this city, that he is what's yeah. valuable here in this city. Yeah. Being living with him, being with him, not those material things so that we all on earth just love having and envy and, well, hope this group doesn't, but. <laughs> well, we're tempted to, no doubt, yeah. We are, we are. We're told we're supposed to. Yes, we're conditioned well for that, aren't we? Yes, we are. It, it props up a system that we were born into, for sure. Now, I, I love what you said there. Cecilia, because it goes perfectly with the order of the flow of this revelation. Before we get to a description of these these um, dimensions and these materials and their quality, what God emphasizes immediately when he gives John the vision of the new creation is not any of that. What does he emphasize? Look at verse 3 with me. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God and his citizens are the central issue in, in his mind, apparently, to the wonder of the new creation. All this material, all these dimensions, not to say they're meaningless, but they clearly come second. <laughs> they clearly are not the focus of God's uh, new creation vision. But they do symbolize what God values, which are uh, the tribes, the apostles. They represent God's people. They represent the beloved, the holy ones that he has brought into his family. Um, so I love that he includes these, the tribes. I love that he includes the apostles. and Because, again, I, I connect them with the family of God that's being built, the, the, group of the, the community of the holy ones that is being gathered together under them. And that's fantastic. Uh, the the great on, yeah. Let me throw I'll just throw another twist on uh, clams for you. Um, we don't know what what all's in the ocean. You know, we don't really have a clue in the depths of the ocean. But there are giant clams. Yes. Some of these giant clams are not going to be big enough that they've eaten people. And, uh, <coughs> Hello. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Look it up. I'm yeah, going to right know. now. Mm, yeah. And there's one there that they have on display right now that's over two feet long. Oh my and gosh. It's got a value of like three million something. Uh, so pearls are really, and, and when you get into a pearl big enough for a gate, which I suppose God can make that anything he wants it to be, <laughs> uh, or big a clam he wants it to be. That's <laughs> right. But a lot of value, but my point is. Value, you know, like we look at gold, we look at silver, we look at precious metals as being so valuable. But uh, pearls have a absorbent amount of value to them, and that's maybe why the gates are of one pearl because of the tremendous value of that. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm gonna hide my face again. I found this on a quick search. Look at the size of that clam. That could bite half of a, her, a human being. This woman, whatever she's up to, cleaning it out. But can you imagine the size of a pearl that this would produce? This would be the biggest or torso. Yeah. But that doesn't even come close to a gateway. I mean, that's why it stretches the imagination for these descriptions, right? That's awesome. Yeah, thank you for uh, mentioning that. It inspired me to take a look. I, I hadn't looked these up before. That's a big clam. And just another spin there for you. That's right. So much to explore in all these images. Let's talk about the street. It says, in this is again in verse 21, the end of verse 21, the great street of the city, uh, which doesn't seem to indicate it's the only street there is. It's the main, it's the main street, the, the thoroughfare, uh, which in my mind means it leads to the center of the city. I think that would be the model of, of the ancient cities. And it would usually lead to the temple or lead to the... The residence of the uh, 
lawmakers or of whoever is in, in charge there. And we'll, we'll be seeing more of that as we go uh, into chapter 22. But again, uh, you know, uh, sorry for the repetition, but the idea that this is made of gold so pure, it's transparent like glass. Um, this is probably the most famous detail of the vision, uh, the streets of gold. We also hear about the pearly gates. Want, want to remind you, we use that language to talk about going to heaven. That might be appropriate, but according to Revelation 21, this is a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, it's possible, and, and I'm bringing this up because of something we've talked about before, but in chapter 21, verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old Sounds order of things has passed away. What's that? Sounds like the end of the old after everything is gone. So I, I, would, I would agree it's likely, definitely, well, I would say definitely. It looks like crisply that it's the new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth. Yeah, and so we want to be careful now that we're studying this. Let's not use language of future things to describe present things. Um, I do not know very much about what heaven's like right now. Because most people appeal to this vision to know what heaven's like. And I just caution, maybe not. In fact, we already know there are unpleasantries in heaven. We saw a battle taking place there, for instance. We see the souls under the altar crying out for justice and the judgment of uh, people of earth. Um... The whole motif of judgment fills heaven. I mean, you know, there's angels filing out from the presence of God, ready to do the terrible work of judging the earth. So the idea that as soon as you cross over into the heavenly sphere, it's all positive, all good vibes, all, you know, the hippie dream, uh, that doesn't really seem to hold up. What we often are talking about when we talk about heaven now is a vision of the New Jerusalem later. And... I think there's actually ample evidence scripturally that heaven itself needs to be renewed. Heaven itself does, which, again, my mind has a hard time with that because I was raised my entire life with the clear picture that heaven is perfect, unlike this yeah, garbage. It's almost like heaven is the goal, but there's more than that. Yeah, I agree. I was raised the same way. Yeah, and it's symptomatic of what you just said. Because our ultimate aim, the way we preach the gospel, our ultimate aim is to make it to heaven that has to be the perfect place right now. But if you expand the kingdom message to its true expansion, which is the new creation, oh my gosh, it opens up a whole new dimension. I don't say that because I think people who go to heaven right now are miserable or that it's just as bad as being here on earth. Not at all. I'm just saying we need to be more careful and precise in how we talk about things um, just so that we don't give people false impressions and or give ourselves false impressions either. So, everything we talked about before, Ryan, I think that's exactly what it, what it kind of pertains to. It's like, as we talked about the souls under the altar, and they're saying, oh, how much longer? And, and I'm sure that, that heaven now is not anywhere as near what heaven is going to be. But without going to that heaven first, we won't make it to the other heaven. Yes. So it, it might be more or less like we talked earlier, so sort of like... Um, um, the way it used to be before Christ, kind of like a, a holding pen, sort of like an area, something, you know, where everybody's at, waiting, like the, the, the souls talked about, they're waiting, but the alternative is hell, and that, and, and I, I believe everything we've talked about, that still is a terrible, terrible place to be now when you die, and, uh, so I think the, the, the comparison of the two makes heaven, even what it's like now, you know, um, millions of times better than, <laughs> yes. than the people who are not saved. Amen. And with the hope of the, you know, the, the final or the new heaven and the new earth coming at some time is a great hope where the people who are in hell have no hope. Their, their hope's gone. They're, they're not, yeah. not going to do that. They're not going to get to do that. Right? Agreed. So, and I agree with you. It's, it's, heaven 
uh, today uh, probably is, is nothing like what everybody thinks it is, but it will be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're basing that thought on a picture of the future. Exactly right. So um, a promise. They promised this thing. Yeah. Yeah, one, one thought I have about the current state of heaven. If you think about uh, a capital city in wartime, uh, it doesn't mean the war has reached the city. I don't think there's always war, warfare in, in heaven. I don't think that. But if there is a war going on and God is the, the one managing that war on his end, because he's king, and, and Christ his son is, is doing it with him as his co-ruler, uh, you would think that that detail by itself, that reality by itself, means that the heavenly city as it is now is thoughtful of things that are negative, thoughtful of things that are uh, of serious consequence, because God's attention is very much are on earth and the war for happening there. So I do, the way that John sees the vision of heaven, I think that is realistic in the sense that there is probably a lot of activity the coming and the going, the sending and the and the returning of God's agents as they execute a war on His behalf. Um, when we in, as human beings are praying and acting in faith and in the power of the Spirit on earth, God is sending out His angelic hosts to take part in this with us. So to think that if you're in heaven, you're oblivious to anything uh, of earthly consequence, that you're just kind of enjoying your retirement, so to speak, in, in the sky... To me, that all is so Hollywood, not Scripture. Uh, scripture paints the picture of a true a city with a true king overseeing a real war. And uh, I just think that's... It may not be as pleasant to put in a Hallmark card, but I think that's actually even more joyful for me. Because when you cross over into the heavenly threshold, God is still concerned with what's going on. And He cares so much about it, He's He's... I picture him around the war table I, I, on his throne taking care of real business because he's not done yet. The war isn't over. He can't just sit down and enjoy his kids, you know, as and play catch with them because they're here now. The war goes on. So, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because that's not something uh, that is brought up very often. Uh, I had to be corrected on it. And so, if anyone else needs to be as well, then there you go. All right, so that's the city, the main street of the city. Uh, we don't know about the side streets, but that's okay. He didn't want to tell us. Uh, unless there's anything else. I imagine they're much better than our side streets. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're not piled with snow. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> yeah, they probably don't need pens either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just get a, get a new chunk of gold and shove it in there, yeah. Uh, let's go to verse 22. What right, a... Can I say something about 21? Yes, please. Right. I was thinking about the fact that uh, what Cecilia was talking about uh, earlier, uh, things that are of value to us here on earth, uh, and it's not the same value to God or in heaven. So I got thinking about this city being paved with gold uh, for people to walk on. Now, if we had gold here, we wouldn't we'll be walking on it. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it, it, you, you deal differently with it. It's something that's beautiful and it's to be displayed. Here, here's a street that people are going to walk on, so that's how valuable it is, or yeah. how invaluable it is, if you will. Yeah, so common. In fact, I, I skipped over something I put in my notes that I don't want to skip over, so I'm going to go back here. Let's, let's hold back on 22 for a second. There's two texts in the Old Covenant Scriptures uh, that as I was looking into the gold thing, how it's used throughout scriptures, really caught my eye. Uh, 2 Chronicles one fifteen is one of those. Uh, but before I turn, flip there in my, in my online uh, picture for you, and you can't see it, so that's not helping you. There we go. I did want to show you that verse I was referencing uh, before, so I did a little search on the word valuable. It's not in Matthew. It's not in Luke. Well, where'd it go? Is I'm going to use the other word then. Detestable. You're getting to know my process of getting it wrong when I do searches. How about that? Okay. There you go. You just like, this is what you don't do. This right. is, learn from my mistakes, everybody. 
<laughs> no, that, that's actually one of the cool things about the online searches. If you got one word wrong, you're like, ah, oh, I'll try that other word that's in there. Okay. So in Luke 6, 16, 15, Jesus said these words. And I wanted you to see them. I wanted you to hear them. You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, speaking of the religious leaders. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Hello. Uh, and that, that's what came to mind when we were talking about these things of what's really valuable. And by the way, the, the preface to that statement by Jesus is this comment by Luke. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And that's why he rips into him. Oh, guys, you're sneering at me. God's sneering at you. He knows what's in your hearts. You love money. That's gross. Anyway. What chapter and verse was that? That's Luke 16, verses 14 to 15. Thank you. I could be sharing my screen with all of you at the same time, but that's a lot for me to keep in mind, and I'll leave something out if I try to juggle all that, so <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, so I was going to take you to Second Chronicles one fifteen. What are you doing? One. Second Chronicles one fifteen. This is a description of Solomon and his greatness, the wealth of the kingdom under Solomon, Solomon's personal wealth. And look at this uh, detail in verse 15. The king Solomon made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? It almost parallels what we're seeing in the New Jerusalem. Common as stones in the city of Jerusalem. Not everywhere, but in the city, in the city of the king, silver and gold are as common as stones. And what could you make out of stone? A road, I guess. <laughs> if you're Romans, you did. So the Romans received the revelation. The revelation... Uh, which is in the Roman Empire, where the roads are made of stone that last for the generations. And you connect that to something pre-Roman, which is in Solomon's kingdom of, and, and city of Jerusalem, gold is as common as stones. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Hey, Ryan, let me throw another one out uh, Whenever Dalton was stationed over at Qatar, over the Persian Gulf, uh, they sent me pictures back, and he said the way those people live over there None of them work. They, they have so much money. The country has so much money from all the oil and the riches that they just send everybody that is a, uh, uh, lives there uh, a check every month. They, they just automatically get that. Oh my what goodness. I was thinking about was he, he, showed, he sent me pictures I have of like the, the stores, the malls, the, all the stuff. And the floors, the floors are actually gold. They have so much wealth and their floors. Oh my are gosh. Gold, gold, you know, gold all through the floors. And I don't know, probably like a, like a sealer because 24 gear of gold would just wear away away. So they probably put some kind of a, an epoxy on it. But uh, some of the pictures he sent me, they've got so much wealth that their, their floors are made out of gold. <laughs> they've just got so much money. Hopefully that oil doesn't run out because then I'll have to start ripping up those streets or those, that's those right. floors. <laughs> you know, and start yeah. on it. <laughs> but that's that's the way it is over there. And that's, you know, the Middle East, Qatar, right in the Persian Gulf. Wow. It's right by Saudi Arabia, you know, where he was at. And uh, some of the pictures he sent, oh my gosh, you can't, you can't even imagine what it's like with the wealth. And that's it. You can't. I can't for sure. And uh, certainly, anyone who's hearing the revelation is the same way, like, huh? How can this be? Um, uh, similar to what you just mentioned, Bill, there was another um, another city uh, nation, because a lot of the, the cities back then were their own nation, right? Tyre, uh, who received a word from God that was not at all encouraging... <laughs> God said, and this is in Zechariah 9, verse 3, Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. 
Tyre was so wealthy because they were they were at the center of the trade empire of that region, right? Tyre was so wealthy. Uh, in fact, Yahweh speaks of Tyre in those terms we've looked at before that make it sound like it was Satan, you know, as the cherubim and all that. But bedecked and bejeweled and, and all this glory that Tyre, God said, Tyre had, and the king of Tyre. But here in, in Zechariah 9.3, Tyre is heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. That's how much wealth was flowing through this place, just like Solomon's uh, Jerusalem. So it made me think that God is following that same cue in describing his city. The, because in the ancient mind, that, that uh, wealth shows you the greatness of the king. That wealth shows you the greatness of the kingdom when the capital city is this profoundly wealthy. It kind of reminds me, you mentioned the prophets, Isaiah 54, where it talks about uh, he'll rebuild Jerusalem uh, with stones of turquoise, foundations of lapis lazuli, like that kind of, I mean, obviously before that it's not really pretty, but he, he mentioned he'll rebuild them, and you know, gates of sparkling jewels, so walls of precious stones, like it's a very amazing, crazy visual of you know, what we see. Yeah, and he clearly is showing the fulfillment of all those promises, right? In Revelation 21, exact good. Uh, yeah. You make these connections as you read the Old Testament. You're like, wait a minute, that reminds me. Yeah, perfect. Well, I think you're right. I think I think uh, the gold and, and all the riches does depict the leader, the king. Yeah, and, and that yeah. kind of falls in here. You know, look, look at what what what, uh, what God did for Solomon. He didn't ask for wealth. He asked for wisdom, but he gave him wealth. He gave him all this, and he had so much money and so much of everything. That showed everybody uh, he commanded re commanded respect because of what he had, which was what God had given him. So all these riches, uh, pearls the size of a gate, that kind of depicts the king, which in that instance is God. Yeah, that's right. Is Solomon uh, considered like a, a type of Christ, a third typology of Christ? Yes, in the sense that. Um when God, when, it sounds when, like he asked his father for like wisdom, and then he, you know, God blesses him with wealth. Kind of, you know, it, it seems sort of uh, like a kind of typology, kind of uh, obviously oversight, not you know, just all the temples and all the things. But yeah, well, he he is a type of the Christ in that he's the son of David that God said um, he would treat like his son, and so most immediately that was Solomon. But that same exact language is quoted in the New Testament to be speaking of Jesus, the, the right. truest son of David, right? Also, Solomon's the son of David who built the temple, and Jesus is the builder of the church. Like, so there's all kinds of typologies there in Solomon, for sure. Well, you are mentioning because he, like, he made these stones kind of common. It kind of made me think of, of that kind of high view of yeah, typology or something. So. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it says that Solomon, <laughs> when he's building his own palace... And his throne and all this. He's, he's using gold for everything. And it said he did not use silver because silver was no longer valuable in Jerusalem. <laughs> the <laughs> like, price was down on he had so it much bad. silver. Yeah, it was like, you know, using dirt. <laughs> That's how much wealth Solomon had flowing through there. Crazy. Well, one more. Go back and look at Leviticus. Look at the... Look at the uh... Uh, the riches and the gold and, that and everything. Look at the Ark of the Covenant, how, how that was built with specific, certain, perfect, yeah, no like, expense, with the value, you know, of great value, and, and everything that that had great value had a great leader attached to it. I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, because I was actually about to go to that exact thought. Before we leave the Golden Streets, I wanted to mention... I actually spent a lot of time looking at it. I don't know why it didn't come to my mind to bring it up. Um, I was I was looking into the the details of God's uh, uh, instructions to Moses about how to build the tabernacle and all the priestly items and all the items of worship. Just wanted to share with you some of the things that he said were to be gold. Um, as you mentioned, the Ark of the Covenant was wooden. The 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 bottom part of it, the chest part of it was wooden, but all of it overlaid with gold. There were gold rings attached to it, four of them. The poles used to carry it were wood, but 
overlaid with gold. But the entire lid of this thing, the atonement cover, was gold. It was pure gold, not wood with gold on it. It was all gold. And there are these cherubim on the top of it, hammered gold. So that's a lot of gold in this chest, right? But everything visible is gold. And then you had uh, the golden lampstands, which come up again in Revelation. The seven gold lampstands. Crowns of gold. Golden bowls full of incense. Oh, I'm in Revelation. Sorry. I'm going. Let me go to Exodus. Um, the table for the bread, overlaid with gold. Overlaid poles. The plates, the pitchers, and the bowls, all gold for the inner, the inner room. Uh, as I said, lampstand, wicks, wick trimmers, trays. By the way, he gives you how much gold was used for that. 75 pounds of gold. Just for the lampstand and accessories. 75 pounds of gold. That's a, you know, that's a human, small human child. Um, there were 50 gold clasps for the tabernacle curtains. Uh, frames and crossbars overlaid with gold. Uh, the holiest place curtain had the same thing. Posts overlaid with gold with these gold hooks. Uh, gold, gold, gold everywhere. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up is Solomon follows suit when he builds the temple in its greater uh, glory, humanly speaking, than the tabernacle was. He covers everything with gold. The entire sanctuary inside, the holy place and the holiest place, the whole thing, golden on the inside. And then gold, all these other places. When uh, Herod built up the temple to make it more extravagant in, in his time, he had so much gold in the temple, uh, according to the historian Josephus, the reason the Romans completely demolished the temple with no stone left on another, like Jesus said, was, guess what, to get to gold. Because as it was burning, the gold melted and it ran into the cracks of the stones that they used to erect it. So in order to get to that gold, the Romans shoved all the stones off each other so that they get to the, the gold that was inside the cracks. That's that's the nature of the gold in the worship of God. So You're saying 75 pounds of gold. That's, uh, if it's on today's market, I was curious. It's apparently $2,036,000 just for that 75 pounds of gold. For, for, the, for the lampstand and its accoutrements. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, 1863 an ounce. Hello. You know, another thing to think about, too, you know, talk about silver and talk about gold and talk about silver not having the value. Whenever you you look at look at God, I think, silver, silver we have a lot of value to, but silver tarnishes, and it, and it, and it commands a lot of attention and a lot of polishing and to make it look good. And if you don't polish it, it doesn't look good anymore. It looks awful. Or gold never tarnishes, it never changes, it, it stays gold no matter what the weather is, no matter what the conditions, it never needs polish, it's always perfect. Hmm. Yeah, that plus second best isn't good enough for God at all. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Who would want to tarnish, you know, tarnish something tar that would tarnish and, and be old looking and look terrible, where gold does not, never does. You know, Mark and I, um, we're lucky enough we traveled my niece lives in italy and we traveled to rome and she took us all to all these old churches and we got to see where they did all maybe it's back from the roman times where we went to ruins and everything but there was a lot of gold they used there and even the poor people would bring gold bowls that they didn't set in there to give to the church just so their gold would be in the walls so I thought that was really something. Um, mm. They took, apparently you said they took the gold from the Jewish people, the temple, and then they must have used it in their homes. And then later on, they used it in the, where they worship in the churches. Oh my gosh. Not the Jewish, yeah. So um, it's always been for worship, hasn't it? Actually, I was... I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That, that was one place I was going to go next, uh, probably to round out our talk for the, the evening. Um, so, so two things. One, and then I want to finish on what you just brought up, Cecilia, or a, a part of what you brought up. Uh, one, I wanted to just point out, when I brought up how gold was used in all these um, things for worshiping God in the Old Covenant, 
whether the tabernacle items or the, the temple. Um, when you think about the city not having a temple, as we're going to see in verse 22, it, it almost seems like the city is the inner sanctuary itself. And God dwells in it. And there's no temple in there. But the way that the city is described, it made me think about the city itself being the inner sanctuary. And God just dwells in it. Um, because the entire city is gold. And like I said, in Solomon's temple, the entire inside of that inner sanctuary, which is the word for temple in, in uh, verse 22. It's not the whole temple complex. The word in verse 22, temple, is the sanctuary. The specific smaller area where God is seen understood to dwell. Uh, so I, I thought that was an interesting thought in relationship to the temple. But I guess we could finish here because this is again application time. One of the reasons I think in, in the ancient uh, expressions of the church leading up to right now in our modern expressions of church buildings and church, the way we do, do things as churches, I think we have in a lot of ways mistaken old covenant things in, in bringing them into new covenant things. So for instance, when you read the old covenant scriptures, you see that when you want to worship God, you bring these really expensive and beautiful and intricate and, and, and just impressive things. So you bring a bunch of wealth and you turn all that wealth into really beautiful, expensive things to, to use to honor God. And that goes all the way through uh, the old co covenant practices. Jesus arrives, and he's a poor man. And he owns nothing except the clothes he wears. He's supported by people following him, which mostly are women, apparently. you know. And so he's a poor man leading this new covenant movement. He does not bring a lot of wealth into the picture, as far as we can tell. He's not donating a bunch to the temple. He's not trying to get the temple renovated to be even better than it was. What is, what is the only thing we know Jesus spent money on from his, his purse? Food. His disciples would go get food. And the poor. Judas would take money from the purse and give to the poor. So frequently that when he got up from the table at the Last Supper, they didn't know why he left. He had to go make arrangements to betray his master, obviously. But they didn't know that. They thought, and this is one of the Gospels tells us, they thought Jesus had told him to go give to the poor. So he just got up and went and did it. Clearly, Jesus did that frequently enough that that's what they assumed was happening. If that wasn't Jesus' habit, that wouldn't have come to their minds, right? So Jesus, with the wealth he had at his disposal, was meeting the needs of he and his, his compadres, and giving to the poor. Now, take all that, you move forward into the, the church's life after Jesus goes back to Father, and the majority of the people coming to the church are poor. There's a bunch of widows, there's a bunch of slaves, they're primarily poor people. Now, when wealthy people do come in, what, what is expected of them? We don't find any record of any of the apostles saying to wealthy people, like Lydia in, in Ephesus, or, sorry, Philippi, we would like you to build us a really nice building with really nice furniture, with really nice this and that, because darn it, God deserves the best. Jesus deserves the best. What we find is the early church leaders saying, will you give what you have to help feed the poor in our community? Will you give what you have to, to take care of our poor brothers and sisters? And the widows and orphans, and they keep doing their, their Exa stuff, yeah. Exactly right. You look at it because... Yeah, they meet at houses and everything. They don't really see a need for like a, yeah, to spend it on that kind of stuff, which is different from us now, especially. Yeah, and that's kind of my point. That rather than taking the new covenant momentum of how to worship God in the very best way, so many times we revert back to the old covenant mindset of yeah. fixtures and buildings and vestments and all these things, and what you were talking about in the in the architecture and the the fineries of Roman Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, all these places, and now in our modern church buildings, we, we say to each other, God deserves the best. But we're, we're not really listening to what God says he thinks is best. What he thinks is best is take care of those needy ones. Do this and that. Amen. And we almost are like, like Caligula giving a, a necklace of pearls to a horse. And God's like, huh? <laughs> 
what are you doing? Um, and there, there is something really powerful about the example of Jesus in the early church that is meant to navigate us. Our wealth is not meant to be, um, this is a general blanket statement, you know, I'm not judging everyone who ever spends money on buildings for churches and stuff, but generally our mindset has to be our wealth is meant for the welfare of those in need, um, taking care of people, not building things for ourselves to feel like we're, we're touching God in some way. Um, and I, that, yeah, that's one of the lessons I'm, I'm getting from this. God can build himself a really nice city <laughs> uh, yeah, in, <laughs> in the eternal future. Right now, he's given us clear directive. Uh, let's end in this one spot, because uh, I think this illustrates well what I was trying to communicate. If you go to 1 Timothy with me. Compare what what Paul says here about 1 Timothy 6. Compare what Paul says here to Timothy to what a lot of Christian teachers, leaders might say to folks about what to do with their wealth these days. And hint, hint, a lot of people these days will try to encourage you to give more and more to the church or give more and more to that particular minister because then God yeah, will... I think we talked about that. Uh, I mentioned it in New Foundations, like how we see, unfortunately, some uh, people get lost in the, the chase of pursuit of money. And, and, and verse 9, that's very clear. Uh, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money itself, right? This is, a, this is a commonly misquoted statement. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with griefs. Now you go to verse 17. This is in uh, 1 Timothy 6. Now Paul is going to tell Timothy, this is what rich people need to hear from their shepherds. This is what they need to know from Jesus through his shepherds. Command, right? Command, not suggest, not advise. Command, this is from Jesus then, if it's a command. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Now, take it into the context of the New Testament scriptures. That does not mean share it with the church treasury. They didn't have such things. Share it with those in need is clearly the implication. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So in other words, in, in God's um, eternal roles, I think he's more... He's paying more attention to what we've done to help the, the, those in need rather than how much have we given to build a new building. Or And again, I'm not judging that because that person's motives could be beautiful to God and he could reward that richly too. I'm saying as leader, as a leader of the church, I need to be focused on what he was focused on, which is not expanding our little empire, <laughs> you know, as a, as a church organization, so... That's one of the takeaways I had from, from this vision that John had, just the, the priority of God about things. Brian, let me ask you a question here before we close up. Sure. You know, God lives in everything that, that, that we've ever talked about, looking at the temple, looking at everything. The most elaborate, the most beautiful, the most wonderful portion of that is where God resides in the holy and holy. Well, whenever the New Jerusalem comes down, that's where he will reside. That will be the Holy of Holies. Yes, agreed. And, and we, have, we will have the right to go there. Like when the curtain ripped, you know, that, that yes. allowed us to go into the Holy of Holies and reside with God. Oh. That's, that's amazing. That's so good. Yeah, and remember in the old system, one man, once a year, one purpose, and then get out of there. And you're exactly right, the abiding. 
Oh, that's so good. And then we're going to get to it in chapter 22. But uh, the, the kings bring in the glory of the nations into the city. It's not just Jews. It's not just men. It's not just a high priest. Everyone's invited. Oh, my goodness. So good. Good word, brother. I hope you're, I hope you're excited. This is wonderful. And how great is our God? How great is our God that this would be his city he's making for his people? He's building that for his community. I love it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, who joined us uh, wherever you are and whenever you might be watching this. I'm glad you did. And I'm going to shut down the stream so that we can pray just in case there's any personal things. Um, if, before you go, though, if you have any prayer requests you'd like us to lift up, uh, if you don't just want to type that in, Hector or I will be able to see that, and we'll make sure to, to stand with you in prayer. Good night, everybody.